coming to you from the home of the mini trees. We're all around the world, the U.S. and overseas. Here to be informational and generational in all that we discuss. Inspirational, motivational, so come along with us. Hi everyone. Welcome for the first time to Pixel Talk, a weekly talk show created to inspire the Stanford OHS community through an interview and several one-minute features. This week's edition brings you Hamilton, a hip-hop enhances a Broadway hit by Claire Langdon, an overview of Tardigrades by Peyton Robertson, and a preview of this season's Movies and Shows by Natalie LeBaron. We will wrap up with a quick talk with 2015 National Geography Bee runner-up Shreya Yalagada, hosted by Shannon Madden. But let's set the ball rolling with an interview with former President of Pepsi and CEO of Apple, Mr. John Scully, who was also the founding investor in MetroPCS and helped launch Hotwire.com. To keep things short and sweet, the Pixel Talk presents an abridged version. The full interview can be accessed via our YouTube channel. This is Tej Singh broadcasting from New Jersey on behalf of Stanford Online High School students around the globe. Hello world. Along with us is Mr. Scully, used to be the former CEO of Apple and a president of PepsiCo and is involved in numerous startups uh, lately. So I just wanted to ask you a quick uh, question. You're alumnus of great institutions like Brown University and uh, Wharton School of Business. And a lot of our audience, in fact, is high schoolers who are just applying to these schools or even in the future who might be thinking of or just starting their higher education career. Do you have any advice for these students and what uh, uh, anything to help them in their future? Uh, yes, I do, Tej. And first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to meet with you. Uh, we get several hundred requests a day uh, for various interviews. And my wife, Diane, who happens to also be a mathematician and a computer scientist, uh, said she thought the invitation from you, Tej, was particularly uh, interesting. And so it's a pleasure for me to meet you and, and to be on your show. Uh, I have uh, a lot of advice for uh, people thinking about uh, what they should do in high school and what they might do later on. First, uh, <clears throat> the education system that <clears throat> we all have gone through uh, in elementary school and now into the early days of high school, early years of high school, is largely uh, crafted around a model that was designed for the 19th century, early 20th century. And those kinds of jobs don't exist anymore. And so it's very, very important that anybody who is in high school today take seriously the STEM courses, science, technology, engineering, and math, even if you have no interest to be a scientist or a mathematician or a physicist or an engineer, everybody needs to have kind of a, a basic uh, grounding and hopefully it'll stimulate curiosity in those fields. Also, it's very good to have a balance of liberal arts as well, meaning uh, understanding what's going on in society, politics, art, uh, performing arts, uh, all of those things. So uh, life isn't going to be just STEM, but uh, STEM is quite important. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. For example, lots of our uh, classmates, they're accomplished. Some of them are uh, re write journals and academic uh, famous journals, and then others are, in fact, like tennis champions, others have their own software businesses, but everyone wants to get involved in STEM, but what's the best way, do you think, to get involved? Should they have internships in technology, and, or should they start their own app, or build a company? What do you think is the best way to get into this field for young high schoolers? Well, when I was in high school, um, we had nothing called STEM, and I had a big curiosity in science and electronics, and so I was a co-founder in my high school of the Amateur Radio Club. And we were actually building our own transmitters. I became a ham radio operator when I was 13 years old, K2HEP. And uh, I had the curiosity to say, so how do you do hands-on uh, experiments with electronics? And I think that a, a lot of the really aha connection moments, you know, the aha moment meaning when, wow, I see why, you know, something is important. I see why something is possible, uh, comes when you have hands-on experience. 
So whether it's formalized through a STEM course or whether it's a club that you join or even start or whether it's projects you do with your friends uh, or whether it's things you just think about and dream about, uh, hands-on experience is even more than the academic formalized courses that one takes. And so uh, you'll find that the people who are most successful in Silicon Valley, um, many of them even dropped out of university. Uh, many of them uh, didn't even go on to university. You say, well, that's crazy because there's so many smart people in Silicon Valley. But the reality is they had curiosity. Uh, as Steve Jobs and I used to say, you've got to have insatiable curiosity. And they wanted to get hands-on experience. They try things. That's why you often hear the metaphor uh, some of the early companies started in garages in Silicon Valley. It doesn't have to be a garage. It could be a kitchen table. You know, it, it could be a desk in your room. Uh, but getting hands-on experience, trying things. You were telling me earlier when we were chatting before the show uh, that you had just uh, taken a course in C programming and you had a curiosity to learn how to uh, develop some apps for uh, iOS 9 for Apple. And these are all great things to try. Whether they are successful as businesses is really irrelevant at this point in your life. More importantly, get a curiosity, try things out, get hands-on experience, and you don't have to do everything by yourself. Always try to find a friend or a colleague or someone else that uh, who wants to share in a project with you. Always think projects. You did it. But can I just play a quick uh, game with you? It's called This or That. It's a staple of our, uh, it's, it transitions into our lighthearted segment of the interview. Okay. So you have five seconds to think. I'll give you two options and uh, say which one you prefer. Ready? Sure. Okay. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Baked or fried? Baked. Pen or pencil? Pen. Rain or snow? If you have any in Florida. <laughs> Rain. Florida or California? California. Poets or quants? Poet. 100 meters or marathon? Marathon. Night owl or early bird? Early bird. Rock or rap? What's the first one? Rock, like rock and roll? Oh, rock. Uh, white or whole wheat? Whole wheat. Gift cards or cash? Cash. Uh, 10 years ago, Facebook or MySpace? Facebook. And I saved the best for last. Coke or Diet Coke? Diet Coke. <laughs> Thanks for uh, coming on to our show. I really do appreciate it, uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule. It truly was a pleasure having you. Well, and I'm really impressed about how knowledgeable you are and, and articulate. I wish I was as articulate as your age as you are. Uh, sounds like you're in a very exciting school with some wonderful teachers and a wonderful way of thinking about the high school experience. And I hope your message gets out to uh, people all over the world because uh, this is not a U.S. story. Uh, this is a world story. The growth of the world economy is largely going to happen in developing markets around the world where the next billion, the next two billion people, you know, who are aspiring to join the middle class actually do it. And so I'm a huge enthusiast of how do we get people around the world to learn how to become entrepreneurs, to learn how to do the things that we've learned and been fortunate enough to be a part of here in the United States and in Silicon Valley. Yeah, and I think hopefully some of the kids in Stanford OHS will follow in your footsteps. They're perhaps one of the most talented kids uh, I've ever seen in my life. It's amazing when it first came to this. So thanks for joining and I really appreciate it. Hello everyone, my name is Claire Langdon and today I will analyze the Broadway hit Hamilton. I was struck by the unconventionality of the structure which ironically adequately portrayed the story, so I'm going to analyze the musical structure in the play to decipher how Lin-Manuel Miranda coalesced modern music with history to relay the story of our founding father, Alexander Hamilton. One question in particular that addresses the play in its entirety is how Miranda manages to fuse hip-hop with history, two subjects that are typically not paired together. However, because hip-hop tends to carry an implication of boldness, it actually seemingly highlights the factual Milu by setting a mood similar to that felt by the real people. 
As Miranda puts it, quote, we take it as a given that hip hop is the music of the revolution, end quote. Also, due to the fact that it is set during a revolution, each character has resolute beliefs on the developing government. We can theorize that Miranda used hip hop to emphasize this distinct attitude in each character. Here, we see again that the music choice really impacted the potency of the play. Hamilton is unique for its unusually fitting musical structure. I definitely recommend the show and thank you for listening. Hey everyone, I'm Peyton Robertson, uh, editor of the science section for Pixel Talk, and I wanted to start our first episode by stating the obvious, that if you go into outer space without protection, you will most certainly die. What, 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 what? There's a few reasons why this would happen. Um, lack of pressure, which would cause your skin and lungs to inflate like a balloon, uh, lack of oxygen. Um, if you happen to survive all of that, then ionizing radiation would tear apart the DNA in your cells. Now there is some sort of creature that can survive this, and it's called a tardigrade. They are basically immortal, so you can dehydrate it, irradiate it, and they will still keep on living. And scientists found very close relatives of them clinging to the International Space Station this year. And um, it kind of expands the Earth's biosphere in an interesting way because if atmospheric currents can pick up these guys and swing them into outer space, it poses an interesting question about how life on Earth began. Just consider that and try to leave how you would survive in the conditions of outer space. Hello movie fans, I'm Natalie here with the latest news in movies and TV. Opening last week was the latest installment in the Bond franchise, Spectre. And for the kids at heart, Peanuts movie takes a new spin on our favorite comic strip characters while Goosebumps brings back some of the scares and humor from the Halloween season. And if you haven't seen the critically acclaimed Martian, you seriously need to find a theater. Then, the one you've all been waiting for. Star Wars Force Awakens opens December 18th. Then the holiday season brings Krampus to give us a little holiday scare, and December 11th opens Chris Hemsworth's new movie, In the Heart of the Sea. Coming soon for Hunger Games fans, there's only a little time left before Mockingjay2's debut on November 20th. The 25th brings a thrilling tailor of Victor Frankenstein, starring James McAvoy and Daniel Radcliffe. In the television world, this Friday sees the premiere of Marvel's new Netflix original series, Jessica Jones. And other shows that have premiered this fall include CBS's Supergirl, ABC's Muppets, NBC's Heroes Reborn, and Fox's American Horror Story, Hotel. Hi, I'm Shannon Madden, and tonight we'll be speaking to Shreya Yarlagada, the runner-up of the 2015 National Geographic Bee. So, Shreya, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How old are you? Where do you live? And where do you go to school? Hi, Shannon. I'm 12 years old, and I live in Grand Lake, Michigan, and I go to East Middle School here in Grand Lake. Great. So now that we know a little bit more about you, can you kind of talk us through the steps of this competition? What did it take to get to nationals? Well, at the beginning, uh, we go through a school B, which is around January-ish. And once you win your school B, you have to take a qualifying test. If you get into the top 100 in your state, you move on to the state B. If you win the state B, you make it to nationals. And then if you make it to nationals and you get into the top 10, you're on stage on TV. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Although I, I'd assume it would be a little nerve wracking as well. Yeah, it's pretty nerve wracking. What do you think is the greatest takeaway from this competition? What did you learn about yourself? Well, I think through this competition, number one, I gained so much new knowledge about geography and other things like that. But I also feel like this competition really boosted my confidence in a lot of things. Like I feel like I've been more confident in school and other places after this competition. So outside of this geography bee and school, what are your other interests? What do you like to do for fun? Um, well, I'm in robotics. I really love doing that. Um, I play piano. I also take um, speech classes at Ivy Gurkle. Right now I'm in a debate class. And I also take math classes every week. As you previously mentioned, since you are so um, into education, what is one thing that you would change about your schooling or education, and why would you do that? Okay, um, well, I don't, I really think that my school is awesome as it is right now, but if I could, 
I would try to take, you know, more higher level classes or more difficult classes because I feel like sometimes kids who are a little bit more advanced in, than others, especially in my classes, they tend to not be challenged as much. So I feel like if we could change the schooling system or change my school, I would definitely try to make stuff a little bit more challenging for some kids. So as my final question, do you have any advice or insight to offer anyone who wants to pursue a competition such as the National Geographic Bee? Well, number one, this is going to be for fun. So don't take it like, don't, Treat it like a life or death situation. Always have fun whenever you do competitions. And that's like my main motto with this competition. Have fun. Don't stress too much. If you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. Right. Well, that is great advice. Thank you so much for speaking with, with us. It was, it was a pleasure talking to you. Well, thank and, you. And again, congratulations on your accomplishments. In thank you. Thanks for watching. Until then.